Artifacts of the computers that were before now becomes more and more interesting because the people that could actually operate them are disappearing. Um, what it takes to put, build up a museum, how to operate it, how to finance it, how to make it happen um, is something that our next speaker is going to talk about, probably, I would assume, from what I've seen. So please give a very warm welcome to Bert van Acker. Thank you. So I, I, I don't know if I'm going to walk, so maybe I'll, I'll walk or maybe, I don't know yet. Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, as my introduction, I'm, uh, my name is Bart, and I'm the founder of the Home Computer Museum. We're uh, based in Helmond in the Netherlands, and uh, we have uh, actually a mission, so we stated a mission for ourselves. It's on the screens right now, and it's not, this one is flickering, but uh, preserve and share the history of the home computer uh, for and with current and future generations. That's what our mission is, which means we have a lot of computers. Uh, so uh, let's see if, if this works. Does this work? Does, does this work? Okay, I have to walk. So how it all started? As I said, I'm Bart, and I'm a collector. And this message is approved by my therapist. I can now freely talk about it, that I am a collector. Well, actually, as you can see on the pictures, uh, this is how my garage looked back in 2016. No, if a car didn't fit at all. Um, I used to, I'm a drummer, so uh, I created my garage. It was, used to be a studio. I uh, insulated and everything. Um, but uh, it ended up in 2016 that my drum set was permanently, permanently in my car because it didn't fit in my garage anymore. Actually, um, I even had uh, computers stuffed in my wife's walk-in closet, so it was crazy how much computers I had. However, at this moment, I don't call myself a collector for the simple reason a museum director cannot be a collector. A collector is doing nothing than collecting, and a museum director should do something else than collecting, at least in my opinion. So, um, as I said, in 2016, uh, I got the idea uh, of a computer museum. And the reason I got the idea is because I visited two museums, one in England and one in the Netherlands. Uh, both museums had the problem it was no interaction at all. Um, meaning that the computers were off or not working. Or, uh, and a computer, I mean, it's just an object. It's not supposed to be nice, I guess. There are computers that really are supposed to be nice, but most computers are not supposed to be nice. They're uh, objects to work with. So why present them in a way that they're not used to? I mean. Computers should be working, right? That's my opinion. Um, I didn't see any stories. I did have a limited information about a computer, but other than that, there were no stories. Why is this computer made? Who were the people using those computers? That was, that was my, what I found interesting about a computer. I mean, a computer is just a thing with plastic and metal and all that stuff that's in a computer. But more interesting is the story behind the computer. Why is a computer made? Why, who were the people using those computers? And I missed that all in the museums I visited. Uh, also, I found in one museum, I won't call its name, but it's in England, um, I found misinformation. I mean, if you see an Amiga 1200 and the sign says Amiga 500, you do something wrong. If you see a Tandy TRS-80 and it says created in 1979, that's also wrong, it's 1977. And I know that as a collector. But people who are not collectors and people who are not very deeply interested in computers or know about the history of computers go to a museum and see this information and assume a museum is right. And that's really bad. I actually, from the same museum, I got a book, which is even worse. They actually printed a book, very expensive book, and there's information inside which is wrong. 
there's an Amiga 1000 stated. All information about an Amiga 1000, and they printed an Amiga 500. I mean, how hard is that to <laughs> correct the, uh, the right computer? So that has to be changed, in my opinion. As a collector, I've, I came to these museums and was like, this has to be changed. Um, so first thing I did was try to collaborate. I tried to collaborate with the museum in the Netherlands to say, OK, I have this. Uh, you have, don't have information. It's, you don't have the stories. Can I help you? Can I help you in any way to give you the information or to make it nice, to make it a visitable museum that not only for collectors like, like me or maybe people here, but also for, for my wife? They, she should enjoy it as well. Um, I tried to, but it was no use. I couldn't. He didn't want to at all. He's, I, 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 yeah, I don't like saying it that much, but I think he's a hoarder. It's all his, and it's not, he's not able to, to share if information. So that didn't work out. Um, and I wanted to, wanting to do something that actually matters and help people. There's a little bit of history about me. I have a sister who, is, uh, who has autism. Uh, and it was discovered on pretty late age. She was 20, and then it was discovered that she, was, she had autism. Uh, and before that, before that age, she was just a hard learning child. That's how it called back then. Um, so in 20, 20 years, I had experience with one, somebody with autism um, without any label on it, without a sticker that says you have autism. Um, when it was discovered, uh, I had a girlfriend, and she studied psychology. And I was really interested because I, all my life I was helping my sister. So when it was discovered, and my girlfriend at that time was studying uh, psychology, I, think, I thought I, I should do that too. It was my thing. However, I was studying informa uh, technical information, uh, so studying computer stuff. Uh, and I figured, OK, I should finish this first before I do something else. But I think I'm smart. So what I did was just read all the books from my girlfriend. Try, I have a little bit of a head start already. So I did that. Um, but yeah, I didn't do that at all. The reason is the relation ended. And uh, my girlfriend, at that time, uh, she changed a lot, and apparently, if you study psychology, the first two years of your life will be uh, finding your own problems and try to fix that. Uh, she never returned from that, so instead of finishing her study, she actually ended up uh, in a closed uh, uh, hospital. Um, She's now fine again, I guess. I don't have much contact with her. But that was also one of the reasons maybe I shouldn't do that. I was happy with my life at the time, so yeah, don't try to you know, poke in and <laughs> try to fix me because I was fine. So yeah, uh, however, I, I became a system administrator, uh, got into Linux. Uh, I actually did security for a while as well, uh, but I ended up with Voice over IP. Um, and in my work, I found a lot of people doing exactly the same as my sister was doing, having a form of autism. And I also noticed um, that a lot of managers, a lot of companies don't know how to act with, or how to respond to those people. It's a lot of communication. It's only about communication. And um, so in, in, I accidentally tried to be in between, a sort of middleman. Without, I was a system administrator, but I tried to be the middleman. I tried to help those people to have this miscommunication fixed. As I say, I, I, speak, I speak fluently autism, because I have 20 years of experience in that. So I actually helped a lot of people staying in the company. And uh, instead of you know, calling in sick, uh, not being on time anymore, uh, not doing their job, and eventually lose their jobs, I, I kept a lot of people from that. And I'm pretty proud of that. Um, so yeah, this was, I wanted to do that as well when I started with the museum. I wanted to help people. And apparently in the IT, I couldn't do that that much. So that was also one of the reasons I started the museum. And the third reason, my wife asked me. 
as I said, I had my, the, the walk-in closet of my wife was stuffed with computers, and she didn't like that anymore. Uh, I am also, uh, I'm, I'm, I used to be a musician, I'm still a musician, uh, playing in bands and all kind of stuff, uh, and also doing business. So I tried to make a company from a band. So I was just doing the strange things like being a bookings agency and uh, being a band and making a company. So my wife uh, was used to me being away for like 75 weekends. Uh, well, mostly every weekend I was away with bands and uh, I quit with that because children. Um, so, um, yeah, and then I suddenly was home, and my wife said, yeah, you have a bunch of computers in the garage. I had 35 back then. You have a bunch of computers, you go to all these fairs, and you go to the meetings and gatherings of old computers. Why don't you do anything with that? Because I was used to do, you know, making companies. Not that successful, but I was making companies. So, yeah, my wife was one of the, the, the causes as well to create this museum. So, yeah, that, um, that was the plan. Let's make a museum, because why not? <laughs> I mean, I was here and nobody else was doing what I was thinking of. So, okay, let's do that. So, but a museum is a terrible business plan. I mean, I, I don't know if there are any people from companies in here, but, or any managers, directors or anything, founders, but a museum is a terrible business plan. Uh, it depends on external money. I mean, every... Uh, uh, company that is res uh, relying on external money is not a good company, especially if it's only one. I worked at a company that had one big customer, and that customer was saying, mm, maybe we should shop for another one. Yeah, that was a problem. Uh, I don't want that. And I see a lot of museums um, completely relying on external, on subsidy, on external money, money they don't make their own. And I don't, I don't think that's a good idea, because if you have external money, that means somebody else is making decision if they give you money. And what if they decide something else? What if they decide, okay, uh, no, we're not doing that anymore, so let's do something else. And then you suddenly have no money, and you are relying on it, so your company goes down. No. Um, it's always non-profit, which is not a problem, but most people think if it's non-profit, it, it means no revenue, and that's wrong. A museum is a company, so it should have revenue, in my opinion. Uh, it depends on goodwill. Goodwill of people, volunteers, you name it. It, it depends on people trying to help you, which I, I, I loved. Uh, I don't say you shouldn't, but it is one of the facts. And most museums, it's not a business model. It's like, okay, we have subsidy, we ask for subsidy, we ask for money, we ask for funding. Uh, and we just, you know, put a lot of stuff in, make it nice, make information, and that's it. And we'll keep it going as long as the money flows in. But there's no business model, there's no retainable business model in that. So, so I wrote a business plan because it was a terrible idea. <laughs> that's how I am. So, this is actually a screenshot of my business model, of my laptop, of this one. But. I made a photo of my, I don't, I don't, yes. So, the business plan, what, version 1.0. And I can tell you it's still 1.0. We haven't changed. It should be an interactive museum. Computers should be on, working. They are tools to be yeah, used, so a museum should be working. Plus, if a computer is working, it will stay alive. Everybody here knows that if you keep a system off for a long, long time, the batteries will die. And eventually batteries will leak. Capacitors will die and leak. Uh, hard disks will fail, especially the rotating ones. They will fail. Uh, rubber will, will just, you know, completely dis dismantle, and, and meaning that it can't be read anymore. It can't be used to, to read data. So interactive means computers should be on. Computers should be working meaning the life will be prolonged. Simple as that. All electronics should be on, because it makes their life longer. Uh, we should be independent. I don't want to be dependent on anything. I don't want to be dependent on money, external, but also I don't want to be dependent on me. Because I will die eventually. I'm not planning to, but yeah, something happens and I will die. And if I die, should a museum then dissolve? 
That's weird, right? So now we should continue. So we should have something independent of as that as well. I want to help people with autism. One of the main reasons I started, I wanted to help people. I wanted to have good storytelling. People should have a good story to, to walk through, have a good story to, um, to read and have all the information. I'll do a lot of research as well. Find the information. But is this information we can find, is that correct information or is it just bogus? Quite recent example, uh, one of the museums stated on uh, June 5 this year that Apple existed for uh, the, the Apple, now the Commodore PET was released 45, year, no, 45 years ago, yeah, something like that. The Commodore PET was 45 years ago. On June 5th um, was 1977, the Commodore PET was released, according to them. But if you did a little bit of research, you know it's wrong. Because the Apple II came out on June 5th. The Commodore PET came out in October that year. So, quite a shame. Um, we should have future proof. I've seen a lot of museums fall down. Um, doing, you know, a, a museum is, is, is dying. People, uh, there are museums that, that do things that nobody is using anymore or nobody is, 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 uh, is actively remembering. Obviously, a castle, yeah, it's not that it will dissolve suddenly, but yeah, it, it should be future proof. It should be able to continue for at least 100 years by itself, not depending on external money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have a clear focus, because calling it a computer museum is quite broad, right? You need to, the big IBM 360 and AS400, and you need a lot of building for that, a lot of space, especially if you want to have it interactive. I don't, uh, you need the sort of power supply that you have here over in this entire camp. It's not fun. Plus, people, I don't, I don't think people really remember working with an AS400. Yeah, some of them. <laughs> so I had a clear focus, and I wanted to have a museum about the home computer, computer that people used at home. There wasn't any, at least not in Europe. So I came up with a business plan consisting of uh, three pillars, as I call it. The first pillar is collection. So we have a collection part showing everything that uh, we can do anything with the collection, uh, uh, collecting itself, obviously, showing it, going to fairs, going to MCH. Um, care is helping people, helping people with autism, helping people with distance to the labor market, because we broaden it a little bit in the years, but care is uh, p helping people, just helping people be going back to work. And commercial. We also have a commercial uh, branch. And commercial meaning we do services what we can do in the museum. Uh, think of uh, data recovery, reading old media, something like that. Nobody. Yeah. Who can read a five and a quarter inch here? Yay! <laughs> Good. Zip disk? Yeah, <laughs> see, jazz disc. No, still, oh, <laughs> very good. But if you read the data, if you have the, the data, what can you do with it? Can you open it in a, something modern? Maybe, maybe not. And that's where we come in because we have all these old computers working with the original software, so we can just open it in the original software. So that's commercial. We also offer repairs. Since we want an interactive computer museum, we have to have knowledge of all these computers, right? So we have to repair them, because most of the computers we get are broken <laughs> when we get them, or will blow up if we try to use them. Um, so we have to make, make sure we can repair them. But why only use it internally? Why not use it externally? So that's exactly what we did. We just opened the computer repair shop. And in these times, a computer repair shop by itself is not really feasible anymore. It's not a business, unless you do it like huge. But yeah, nobody is, is going to a shop to repair a computer anymore. It's just, you, you know, you return it, throw it away, whatever, or repair it yourself. But you don't go to a shop anymore. It's not the 1990s anymore, or 80s. So 
Yeah, we do that. And we still have a lot of people, you know, don't know how to reinstall Windows. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. Or reinstall a Mac. But also Commodore 64, that's broken. We also repair that. And we always repair. We never replace. We try to not to replace, but obviously if we have to spend six hours to repair a Commodore 64, then you can probably get another one that's probably cheaper than. And no cure, no pay. Simple as that. Um, there's also commercial stuff. We also sell computers, old refurbished computers. It's also what we sell. Old laptops, business laptops, we sell them. Uh, one of our biggest uh, uh, customers is uh, called Stichting Leergeld. It's a foundation that gives laptops to poor families. Um, poor family that has a child, obviously, uh, that goes to school and needs a laptop, but can't, they can't afford a laptop. So we give them a laptop. And that foundation pays us. It's 150 euro, it's not much. But that's what we do. Also, the uh, social service, the uh, work agency. If you have a, uh, somebody who's unemployed and needs to follow a course for their work, for their new work, and don't have the money to buy a laptop, there we are again. We can provide those laptops. And since March this year, we also do that for Ukrainian refugees. And nobody's paying that for, for us, but we just give them away. Somebody comes in, we give them away. And apparently, we are the only one in the Netherlands who does that, because we're in Helmond, which is pretty south, but we get them from all over the Netherlands. People from Ukraine come to the museum to get a laptop. And it's a, it's a normal laptop. It's just, you know, second to seventh generation Core i5 or so Core i7. So they're really decent laptops. We install Windows 10 on it, or Windows 11, if they possible. Install English, Ukrainian, Russian languages, so they can use them. And there's warranty on it as well. They return it if it's broken, and we just repair it. It's that simple. Thankful, we have a lot of companies sponsoring uh, laptops to us for that, especially for this uh, reason. And we also sell them, so you can also go to the museum and buy a laptop. It's always below the 300 euro, because we has, uh, there are shops nearby that sell uh, Chromebooks for 300 euro. We know the, these Chromebooks are crap, but a normal consumer goes either a new laptop or a second-hand laptop for 300, they go for a new one. Then six months later, they return to us because their laptop is broken, but that's another story. Um, so that's the, that was the business plan. And I wrote it down. I just did that. I, uh, you, you saw it. I just made a Word document, and uh, I wrote it down. And back then, I was still using OpenOffice, I guess. I don't know. So that was the end of 2016. And then 2017 started. I had a plan, but I need a building. And it needed to have some requirements. I mean, we can't just have a building, for a standard house. It has to be a good building. And I wanted to have a specific in a city center. I didn't want to be on an industrial area or so. The reason is, I. <laughs> and the reason is, um, museums. Why on an industrial area? It's, it's really hard to get to. Usually they don't have a train station nearby or you have to go with a bus. Uh, secondly, if I go to an industrial area, it means I have to provide food for people. Sounds really stupid, but people come in and they stay for a few hours, hopefully, and maybe they're hungry. So that means I have to provide food. And I'm not a cook. <laughs> So, no, I, I, and I don't want to spend money on that. So, no, I, I stay in the city center. If somebody's hungry, go outside. There's plenty of food over there. They're, they're, that's their job. So, I wanted to be in the city center. And I wanted to rent. Not uh, uh, anti-kraak, I don't know in the English term, but temporary. So, if uh, I don't, didn't want to. What, the simple reason, again, I don't want to have a three weeks notice. So, like, you have the three weeks, and you have to get out of the building. Uh, that's not very nice to have in a museum, right? Especially if you know how many stuff we have now, it's not fun to move anymore, <laughs> really. Um, so I came, I, I had this, this idea, I wanted to have a decently sized building. Uh, at first I asked for 1,500 square meters, but um, yeah, they didn't have that. Um, so I asked to the city, city of Helmond, because I reside in the city of Helmond, and 
Yeah, why not? So I go into the city of Helmond. Um, and they had a plan. They had a big building in, in their mind uh, where they could host four museums in. There were two other museums in Helmond that were getting out of their building because their building was teared down. Um, and they thought of the idea, okay, we have these two, two, two museums and then the home computer museum, and they found something else for a museum. Great, great idea. Good business plan, one big building, mo multiple museums. I think it was a good idea. But yeah, it was the, the city. City council is not going to work. They didn't, have, and they just put in more build, more people and more. Eventually, we, I think we were at 15 companies in the same building, and the building wasn't any bigger. It was a building that already existed and was empty for a long, long time. So yeah, I, I ended up with like maybe 100 square meters. I was like, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, but yeah, the city was still, you know, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. So um, at some point, I, I remember it was in October, and uh, I was talking with, with one of the, the, the people from the city, and she said to me, maybe you should start already with the museum. So, okay. I was like, yeah, sure, let's do that. And uh, now, uh, we, we still spoke, uh, speak a lot, uh, she meant back then that I should start promoting it on the internet. But I was already ahead of that. I was already doing that at the time. So my key was, okay, I have to rent a building. So I did. I rented the building. I didn't want to rely on anything, so I just started. I just went ahead, made some phone calls, and found an empty building, 500 square meters in the city of Helmond. Um, and it was, um, that's me. <laughs> um, these are screenshots from YouTube, this whole, um, yeah, so this was an empty building. It was completely empty. No power, no floor. <laughs> it still had a wall in the middle in, in, uh, in the building. Uh, and it was empty for multiple years. It used to be a, a solar thing. Uh, sunbathing studio or something, and they went bankrupt, and they just removed everything that was copper. So you can imagine that all cables were just trashed off. So it was a mess inside. Um, so we got this building, and uh, by the end of 2017, we got the key for the building. We went into the building. We found out there was no floor. So we called up the, 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 the owner of the building and said, there's no floor. How can I use this? Oh, right, there's a floor, yeah. Um, okay, we, we'll, we'll make it sure that you get a floor. Oh, perfect. So I figured out, nah, let's do six weeks from now. So I calculated six weeks or something like that. Um, so I calculated a few weeks, and um, I came up with 17, March of the 17th, 2018. That will be our opening day. So I put it on the internet. <laughs> As somebody else would, I put it on the internet. We are all going to open. We have a building, and we're going to open on March 17, 2018. Cool. Uh, but the building owner wasn't that fast. <laughs> Actually, she was so slow, or they were so slow, that 10 days before our opening, they poured down the floor. And there was no electricity. <laughs> there was nothing in there. So in 10 days, we built a museum. And I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, is it work? Yeah, it's, uh, that's me, again. So I, I, I'm going to skip through it, it's easy, but because, can I skip through it? No, of course not. No, I can't skip through it. Can I skip? No, I can't skip. I don't have any sounds, I don't need sounds, yeah. Never mind. No, it doesn't work. It, uh, yeah, it, it, it's. Oh, I don't need sound. Okay. Uh, no, I'll, I'll leave it on. I'll, I'll just tell about it. It's working apparently. This is our intro. Um, do I still have, to, I have time? Um, so this is actually what happened between March 9 and March 17. Uh, as you can see, the building. The concrete floor was made on, Mar on Friday, 9 of March. And as we said, we opened on March 17. We 
everybody and everybody knew that we were open at that time, or we were going to open at that time, uh, our sponsors. And I still remember our biggest, our only sponsor actually, uh, came in uh, while we were doing this, and he said to us, yeah, no, you're not going to make it. I'm like, what a bet. <laughs> we worked every day, every single day, from 8 in the morning to 2 in the night with a team of about six people. And I can tell you, after the, uh, yeah, the last day, I had pain. I had pain in muscles. I didn't know I had those muscles. It was incredible. I couldn't, this was doing, this was painful. Just standing was painful. It was crazy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's on YouTube, you can find it. Uh, so I, I'm not doing this because yeah, I'm a museum director, so I will tell, I will talk. I can talk for hours. If, I, if you're ever in a museum, don't ask me to, t to do a tour, because I can talk for eight hours. And yes, I did that already. So anyway, that's, uh, as you can see, it's very empty. Uh, the lights, it was just, this was with one screw, the lights were bolted to the, to the concrete, to the ceiling. Uh, there were cables hanging everywhere, but we managed. We were open on March 17. <laughs> we were open with 25 computers that were working. Oddly enough, all the computers from the 90s were broken, but <laughs> we were open with all these computers. Uh, at that time, I had about 400 computers in stock. And they were scattered all around in several storage units and in my garage at home. And, but we had with 25 computers working, we were open. And, uh, People could enjoy, and we had a great day that day. And I slept a few days after that. But um, yeah, we, we had 10 days of building, uh, and we started. And in, um, by the end of 2018, I'm still holding that thing. Uh, by the end of 2018, we were nearly bankrupt because we didn't have any budget at all. Uh, the total budget we had at the time was 25,000 euros, not dollars, euros. Um, that was about uh, 10,000 of my personal money, uh, and the rest was sponsors and the, the city that gave them a bit of money. That was it. And again, no electricity. So we had to really do every electricity. We had to go from the, from the, the, the box all the way, and we had to do with, with high power, and it was it's crazy. There were no lights. We had to pay for that. There were no walls just to make it nice. There was nothing. But we managed to do it for some, somehow. <laughs> so, um, but by the end of 2018, yeah, we were, we were nearly bankrupt. Actually, we were bankrupt on paper. But since we were still communicating with the people who were, uh, we were owning money to, um, they kept us open. And they, they kept us because we were still you know, asking everybody, asking the city to help us out because there were no, not, not enough visitors. We didn't have any budget to make to make any commercial outings or anything. There was nothing. So we were just sitting in, and we didn't know anything. And um, I was really in doubt of throwing the towel in the ring. I was just, you know, giving up almost. Um, but my, uh, my other founder, uh, Patrick, said, you can't stop now. You've become, you came so far, and you can't stop. Also, I, did, I still stopped working because this museum took up all my time. I stopped working. I didn't have any income anymore. I didn't have any benefits. I just completely stopped. And um, yeah, so by the end of 2018, my savings were completely gone. Uh, I was in debt uh, a lot. Um, the museum was in debt. We were two months or three months behind on rent to the building. So it didn't was it wasn't nice. Thankfully, another company went bankrupt in the same street as we are, and the company at that time was repairing computers. So we heard that we found out that they were bankrupt, or that the 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 the, the city in the city was clo was closing down. The Mycom for the people who know from the Netherlands. Um, we heard this the, this company was closing down. So we went to that, to that company and said, oh, I heard you're closing down. And they told us, yeah, we're closing down. Uh, this morning, we heard that we have to go away by 12. They heard that morning, they have to go away by 12. The, the, the entire building had to be empty. It was impossible to do. 
so I asked him, very polite, we are good friends with them. Uh, we had an agreement, they were repairing the new computers, we were repairing the old computers. That was our agreement with, we did. Um, so um, I asked them, um, is it okay if I put up a sign over here? And she, they said, no, no, absolutely not. We are not allowed to put any signs up. But I'm away on quarter to 12, and I don't care what happens after that. So at 12, exactly two papers on the front door. If you look for repairs, go to the Home Computer Museum. And we picked up all repairs from that shop, went to the Home Computer Museum. And that's how we survived. That was our, our thing that we could survive. So. Yeah. Um, there's also um, yeah, um, more than full our uh, full-time work. We had I worked easy 20, uh, 72 hours a week, easy uh, the entire year. Uh, well, actually, I'm still doing that most of the time. Yeah, ah, see, <laughs> I'm not even half in my presentation yet. <laughs> my God, um, we had a first major story. Um, I'll, I'll come back. Uh, the, the story, um, in, I, it was in August, and um, for, for some complete co coincidence, I, um, I ended up sitting next at a bar, uh, at a cafe, in, uh, in, in a city, in a small city near, to, near the sea. We just, I went there with my family, it was a good day, uh, nice weather, and I said, okay, I've been working for 72 hours a week, let's do a day off for me for one day. So that morning we went into, I stopped in my car with my family and we drove to the sea, the seashore, and we sit there at some random bar. And I had a shirt on uh, and, and in the back you can see they're all brands. And um, the guy next to me said to me, can I ask you something? I said, sure. Uh, I see the, the brands Acorn and Sinclair on there. Um, I said, yeah, now I'm from the computer museum, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm the first importer of the, of the Netherlands of Sinclair and Acorn. The guy was sitting next to me, <laughs> literally. <laughs> How, you, I, can't, I can't figure that out. He was sitting there. So we started to talk, and he also um, uh, import, he imported laser. He imported uh, Acorn. He imported a lot of brands. And his brother-in-law was the first one importing IBM into the Netherlands. This was a guy that was completely unknown on the internet, but he was very key to the role of computers in the Netherlands. His name is Paul Pardon, he still lives. Um, he's a very nice bloke. And um, so we got it made, but the, the thing is, um, he sold Sinclair, he sold Acorn, uh, he gave up all with importing that, and he kept only one company, one company alone, and that is Laser, Laser Computers. That was, he was the only guy in the Netherlands importing laser computers. Actually, they were made in the Netherlands, the laser computers. And um, yeah, there's also uh, Katja Schuurman, who was back then uh, some kind of famous uh, girl from uh, a soap series, which is still going on, by the way. And, and he was telling, he wrote, he made sure the song was written for her, and he booked her. And um, yeah, that's how Katja became famous and laser computer became famous. Laser computer was at some point was the biggest in the Netherlands. And after a while he gave up. A lot of competition from the Chinese market, uh, Dell, uh, it's American, but, uh, but uh, Acer and all that kind of brands. So he sold his company, laser computers he sold in late 1999. And the guy who took it over, um, yeah, he, he fucked it up. That's his simple. And laser computer is gone. The thing is, you can't, couldn't find this information at all. His name was completely, he, did, he doesn't have LinkedIn, he doesn't have any social media, he's completely offline, basically. You couldn't find this information. And um, we have proof, obviously. So what we did is we let him share this story, create this entire story, how he became the importer of laser computers. Um, and that's what we published on our website, and we are still the only one who published the full story of laser computers. So that was the first story. We did that in 2018. So 2019, we weren't bankrupt. So that was good. Uh, and we started to have a stable income. 
because we were helping people. We were helping people with autism, helping people with this to the labor market, and the Dutch government gives money for that. So we had stable income, we had volunteers as well. It was a great system, and we still have that same system. Um, and we had the first contact regarding a new building, because the, current, the building we rented was only for two years. Because when we started to rent it, the city told us, well, after two years, we have this major building, the big building with the four museums in, ready. But in early 2018, just after we opened, the city decided, yeah, you're not coming in that building. So, uh, but we had to do anything else. And yeah, the landlord really wasn't pleased with us because we were still behind with rent. So there was no chance we could ever have a successor, uh, a longer rent period. So we need to have a new building. And it happened uh, that the building next to us, which was much larger and a much better street, um, was empty. And we could, got in contact with the, land, uh, the owner of that building. And he was uh, enthusiastic about it. Yeah, yeah 10 minutes. Huh? Great. <laughs> I'm still in 2019. Never still know. Um, and we won the Her Heritage Prize. That was a big one. We won the Heritage Prize by the end of 2019. Uh, because our combination of social, cultural, uh, entrepreneurship, that's the reason why we got the prize. And it was not decided by a judge. It was decided by the, by the audience, which was quite easy because they had a voting system. And you ask a computer museum for voting systems. Yeah, we can fix that. <laughs> so this is our new building. The entire yellow part is completely us. 1,090 square meters. And we moved in by the end of 2019. And we were closed for the entire month of January 2020. And we figured out it is a good day to open on the 2nd of February, 2020. And we opened that day. <laughs> and we had a YouTuber coming over. It was great. And a lot of people were enthusiastic about us. Yeah. Then Corona and stuff happened. We moved to a new building. We opened on the 2nd of February, 2020. And we were closed on March the 15th. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a great success. Um, but since we had some time on our hands, we had, didn't have any visitors, we started to repair an Astedes. And Astedes is a Dutch CAT computer. Uh, it's, it's a really big computer. And um, yeah, there's, not much, there's no information at all. No schematics, no documentation, no pictures, no videos up to then. Uh, and we had to, we took on the challenge to repair that, to get that machine booting again, just because we can. And we had some time on our hands. Uh, we saved, uh, we managed to stay afloat as a company uh, by selling laptops. We sold in three weeks more than 100 laptops to the foundation that gives to poor families. Because suddenly, home schooling became something. And we had to deliver laptops. It was like the McDonald's at our place. In the front, they were giving out laptops. In the back, they were installing laptops. And I was doing the, the, the administration to send bills. It's a crazy time. But we, in three weeks' time, we, had, uh, so we sold more than 100 laptops. Um, we started to do the Dutch heritage. We received a Holborn, which is a Dutch computer. Uh, if you happen to be in the retro village, we have the Holborn over there working. Uh, and we started to do Dutch heritage, because the home computer stuff you know, it's great, but um, we needed to do more. And we had the Astedes, which is also a Dutch computer. And we have Tulip computers, so that's what we did. And instead of complaining about, oh, it's, it's terrible that we have um, uh, no visitors, we decided to go on the internet. And we took, basically, we took over all social media. We have every social media can find us, except for... Um, uh, I forgot the name. Yeah, never mind. We got all social media, um, and we are actually the, by far the largest computer museum on social media. By simple, every day a picture with a nice story. That's what we do. Every day. So, uh, despite we are closed for uh, four months, uh, 
not one, one month due. One month was closed because we were moving, not due to the pandemic. Um, despite that, we, grow, we grew in revenue, we grew in collection, and we grew in volunteers. We grew in everything, which was completely strange because we are a non-profit organization without subsi subsidy. And we grew in 2020, in a year that we, everybody was complaining that everything went bad. So, despite that, we had less visitors than in 2019. And by the end of the year, we had a very hard time, but we were saved by the sponsors, people getting a year subscription. Um, and in 2020, we were given uh, the largest collection boxed PC games. We counted them. There are 2,200 PC games in our uh, museum. And we got the largest collection CDI in the museum. So, 2021. Yeah, I'm going a little bit fast because I'm, I'm getting out of time. This, told you. Um, we were more, we were more closed. We had six months. We were closed in 2020, 2021. Um, we had less visitors than in 2020. We became member of the Network Digital uh, Heritage (NDE), uh, meaning that we are now uh, um, for museums and for other companies. Uh, we are reading old media and converting the data to a modern format. That's what we do. Um, we became an example of social entrepreneurship by the National Office of Cultural Heritage. So that's what we also are. We got our status working. And at this moment, we are the only one in the entire world that have working our status standing. And we had a massive growth on social media. The only thing we don't have, I, I, I came up with you. The only thing we didn't have, we don't have currently is an OnlyFans. But, uh, it's only social media we don't have. Um, yeah, by the end of 2021, we were again nearly bankrupt. That's, that's our, our thing, uh, by the end of the year, getting bankrupt. Uh, but we were saved by sponsors, uh, donations, and adoptions. You can adopt a computer in the Home Computer Museum. Then we make sure we give them fresh power every day. <laughs> that's what we do. And you can pet it, and you can come and visit it as well. So. Um, we became an essential museum for the preserve uh, of the, uh, the national history. So we are officially uh, uh, yeah, Rijksmuseum, but uh, basically we can't go bankrupt because if we are nearby bankruptcy, then the Netherlands will take us over and fire me. But yeah, that's, so we don't do that <laughs> again. Uh, and we, we covered a lot of data. Uh, yeah, uh, this year we opened the CDI collection. It was planned in 2020, but yeah, there was something happening in the world, so we didn't open. We opened the CDI collection. We actually have the largest CDI collection in the entire world, both hardware and software. All the, all the CDIs are currently are archived already and shared. That's what we also do. We open for everybody to come in and actually share the data. Ah, three, yeah. <laughs> He didn't tell me he had a three. Um, on September 25th, we have the opening of the game collection, PC boxed game collection, which is actually in the Guinness World Record. And we will try this year to have that set again in the Home Computer Museum, because the old record says 1,800, and we counted, and we come up to 2,200. So yeah, we need to fix that. MCH, it was the first time for us, and we love it here. So we hope that we come back the next time. Um, and I think everybody will like uh, likes us too because we have a lot of people coming in our tent. Uh, our visitor numbers are getting better and better. It's not still on the place where we want to be, but I think this year we'll be uh, doing that. Yeah, and I was already out of time with this, so uh, why are we important? I think I told that pretty much. We do preserve the history. We actually tell the stories, we make sure everything is working, that the knowledge is, ke is kept, how things work. And what we can learn about the, the history is the, the speed it went. We went from 1977 with a, a computer that was four kilobytes of memory. We went to a, a thing that, you know, I mean, this is a computer. Everybody here has a computer. And what we learn in our computer museum is that every computer has its own story. And we actually found that a lot of people now who are in the mu musician, who are mu music industry, started out with an Atari. Because we found the link between Atari 
and becoming a musician. And that's very interesting. There's a lot of history to be found in the computer museum. History about people, history about, about technology. It's very interesting. And uh, yeah, I, still, I have one minute left, so uh, I, was, I was already out of time to create more slides, so uh, I'm, I'm fine. Um, yeah, that's not interesting. That's a lot of... Go, 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 go. This is what other people say about us. And the fun thing, I, we have 889, 889 unique computers in our collection. And the total registered items is 30,555. That's registered items, not keyboards, not mouse, um, but really like a monitor or a computer or a particular piece of software or documentation. That's all of you register. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, questions? <laughs> We're in the retro village. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bart. That was I, I would have given you six hours for this talk. Yeah. It's not it's not really <laughs> I can feel it, it's no problem. Yeah. So um, thank you very much. Unfortunately we're out of time. We will definitely drop by either at the retro village or at the museum. And please everyone, please give another warm round of applause for Bart. Thank you very much. Thank you.